All right, so we are finishing up. Uh, we're finishing up the whole class, but uh, tonight we're going to finish up talking about institutionalism with the specifics of talking about benevolent care to non-Christians. And this is the final time that you'll see this slide, uh, at least for a while maybe. Uh, authority, the power of one whose will and commands must be obeyed by others. And as I stated last week, I can't help but go through this lesson and think about the devices of men and the various things that men have come up with and in their own minds think that they're great. Uh, and think about this passage in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And this is just the memory verse that I will leave you with. See, the taskmaster actually decided I'm not going to give them uh, this tonight. But this is one that is not in your book. It's one that I have just added in. Uh, actually one that I started looking at a little closer uh, back last quarter. But Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So we're talking about uh, institutionalism. And uh, so Jesse introduced this a, a few weeks ago. Uh, and we've got this idea of um, of trying to push for uh, churches to help pay and fund colleges. And, uh, of course, uh, they decided eventually that, well, this wasn't working so well, so let's start trying to push uh, the pay or to get them to, to support orphans' homes because those that were trying to justify the support of the colleges recognized, well, the two are going to stand or fall together, and so if we can get them to stand, then they're going to have to help support the colleges as well. Uh, and so we have... Uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, this great debate and ultimately a great divide that happened and division that happened within the church over this very thing. So again, we're specifically talking about the benevolence in regards to the congregation, collective action of the group. Is it limited or is it unlimited? Uh, we define benevolence as goodwill, uh, showing kindness or acts of goodness for the needy, uh, just simply being charitable. And again, when we're discussing this with people, we have to make sure that we stay on point and that we help people understand what the, the issues are because they'll try to muddy the waters by throwing a bunch of different things at you. And again, the, the issue is not should the needy uh, people receive care. Uh, it's not are we concerned about the needy as a church. Uh, it's not about uh, individual Christians and local churches. Do they have benevolent responsibilities? And it is not about our individual congregational responsibilities being fulfilled. That's not the issue. The issue that we are discussing is as a church, as a collective group, a congregation, do we have New Testament authority to assist Christians, non-Christians, or both from the Lord's treasury? And so again, the question that we need to ask is whether or not there is a New Testament pattern for the benevolence of churches. And we talk about 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, retain, retain the standard of sound words or the ESV, which says follow the pattern of sound words words and so is there in fact a pattern and we went through all of these different passages which uh, every one of them talks specifically about benevolence to needy saints uh, and so I believe that there is a very clear pattern that we see within the New Testament and so if there is a pattern we are obligated to follow that pattern and so we ended up class last week with this uh, and I think that this is such a valuable thing for us to recognize when we're talking about New Testament authority in general. If it is not in the Bible, if we cannot find it within the passages of the New Testament, then we are going beyond what is written. It is in addition to God's word. It is not as the oracles of God. It's not according to the pattern. It's not according to truth. It is another gospel. It is of men. It can't be motivated by love. It can't be done by faith. It can't be done in the Lord's name or by his authority. It cannot be considered a good work. It does not pertain to life and godliness, and it causes one to not have God. And so we need to remember those things as we are discussing New Testament authority uh, with, with anyone. So that brings us to where we left off last week, this idea of misunderstood passages. And you've got many arguments that are made um, trying to justify the... Uh, the, the fact that a church has more responsibility in regards to benevolence than it being uh, limited. And so there are three main passages that, uh, that I have uh, discussed with people that have been 
uh, thrown back to me as proof, uh, proof passages for why a congregation can do certain things. And that, the first one is Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. So we're going to look at these passages somewhat in depth. So if you would go ahead and take your Bibles and turn over to Galatians chapter 6. So Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And, of course, they'll look at you and say, gotcha. Right there, it very clearly says, do good to all. So what's the, what's the problem here? Uh, well, one of the things that we need to, to recognize is even within this passage, it, uh, it uses the word us. So what does that signify? So if it's saying us, who is it including? So Paul, who's writing the letter to the Galatians, is including himself. Was Paul a member of the church at Galatia? No. So let's go ahead and start uh, in verse 1, because with any, with any passage of Scripture, how do, we, uh, how do we most appropriately understand a particular passage? Well, it's within its context, and so we have to, to understand the context of the passage, so we're going to start in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, we're going to start over here with uh, Brother Ray, and if you would read verses 1 through 5 and then Miss Shirley 6 through 10. Bear one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in others. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows in the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows in the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. All right, so when we look at the context of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, uh, as we uh, read through, we can look at all of the, the pronouns that are listed beginning in verse 1 and ask ourselves the question, okay, is it referring to an individual or is it referring to the church? And... I mean, you can go down through the, the list there, and obviously as we're reading it, uh, as, a, as a man sows, as one sows, he will also reap. But from the very beginning of the passage, uh, the context is individuals. It has no mention whatsoever uh, of the church. And so just taking the passage uh, in its context, we see that it is talking about uh, individual action. So if we're talking about trying to authorize the church to do something, well, then we need to see church action. We need to see a benevolence, and we need to see non-Christians all right there together, and that's simply not what we see. What we have is benevolence to non-Christians uh, with the individual being uh, referred to here. So again, when we're looking at the passage, there is no mention of the church. There's no mention of the church treasury. There's no mention of any benevolent organization. There's no mention of the church contributing to the needy or the church contributing to a benevolent organization. It's not within the passage of Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Bill Hall notes in his uh, book, Restudying the Issues of the 50s and 60s, he says, Now here's a man reaping and sowing, and the exhortation is not to be weary in doing good. In due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, what does therefore do? Sends us back to all that's been said, doesn't it? 
To what does the therefore point back? As a man sows, he shall also reap. A man. We're not talking here about congregational action. And so after presenting that, you are still going to have some uh, that object, and they will tell you, but the church is made up of individuals. And we talked this talked about this some when we were talking about the distinction between the individual action versus the church's action, and it is true that the church is made up of individual Christians, and that the only way that a local church can function is through those individual Christians, but individual action is still not the same as we have pointed out in that lesson as collective church action. So whatever the individual can do, the church can do is not a valid argument, and we talked about that in in depth whenever we uh, were talking about that lesson, distinguishing the two. Bartzel Baxter, uh, he says, any good work which the individual as a Christian is obligated to support financially, the church is equally obligated to support financially. Incorrect. There has been a great deal of talk about what the individual can do in supporting good works and what the church can do in supporting the same good works. No such distinction is taught in the scriptures. If it is a good work which the Lord wants done, the obligation falls equally upon the individuals and the church, for individuals are the church. And again, as we've pointed out from our lesson, uh, distinguishing the individual and the church, this is simply not true. And there are very clear uh, examples of that within the New Testament of Um, the individual being commanded to do certain things that the church is not and the church being commanded to do certain things that the individual is not. So we have to to recognize that an individual Christian, although it comprises the church, it is not the church. Individual action is not church action. An individual's money is not the church money as we talked about with Ananias and Sapphira over in Acts chapter 5. And the work of an individual Christian is not necessarily the work of the church. We have Things that we are called to do as individual Christians that the church is not called to do. So that is not a valid argument uh, when we're trying to to find authority for church benevolence. And yet you're still going to have some that will continue to to persist that, well, this is uh, authorizing the church to do so because, uh, well, turn back to the very beginning of the book. Turn back to Galatians chapter 1. So in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Boom, got you again. It clearly says that this letter is written to the churches of Galatia. So if the letter is written to the churches, then Galatians chapter 6, verse 10 is written to the churches. So we have authority for the churches to be Uh, uh, participating in benevolence to all. And I think uh, Andy is here. Andy made a good point. I think it was when our our class when we were talking about individual action versus church action, and he made the point when he's up here preaching, he's preaching to the church, but he could be giving individual uh, preaching to us as individuals. I'll use Jesse as an example on Father's Day. As a, as a father, he, he's, he's preaching to me, who's a member of the church, and so we recognize that just because it is written to the churches or because somebody is preaching to a church does not mean that there's not going to be directives that are given to the individuals. And so if you go through the book of Galatians, uh, it, it's, it's full of things that are written directly to individual Christians. And so you could... Ask yourself, what did Jesus die for the sins of the churches? Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. Does Jesus deliver churches from this present evil age? Also there in verse 4. Did the church receive the Spirit? Were the churches baptized? Are churches Abraham's seed? Was the Spirit sent out? And we can go on and on and on. Were the churches circumcised? Throughout the book of Galatians, recognizing that there is individual directives that are given within the book of that was written to the churches of Galatia. And this is throughout Paul's letters and other letters that we see within the New Testament. So the letter to the Romans, uh, it was written to the the, the church there in Rome, but yet instructions are given to individual Christians. Uh, Also the Corinthians, the Ephesians, the Colossians, the Thessalonians. We see these letters that were written to churches, and yet we very clearly see 
uh, individual directives that are being given. Likewise, we have a letter that was written to Timothy, and within that we have instructions that are given to churches. Uh, and so we recognize that that also is not a valid argument to give us authority or to give the church authority to be participating in unlimited benevolence because it says do good to all. It is written to individual Christians. We're the ones that's given the directive there to do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. Turn over to James chapter 1. Go ahead, Todd. Oh. I think you would be hard-pressed to find church uh, authority for local church action in the book of Galatians because it's addressed to multiple churches. You've got Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch and Pisidia in that group, if not others. And so all of his commands tend to be to those people as individuals because there is no collective church action. And so when we establish authority for how we partake of the Lord's Supper or give of our means, you notice we're pulling from 1 Corinthians and places where he's addressing one congregation when you come together as a church. He wouldn't say that to this group because it'd be multiple churches. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this is something that I think that in our everyday lives, people recognize this as well, even at work. If somebody's talking to a, a team of people and yet giving individual directives, um, and, and ultimately what it boils down to is they're grasping at straws. Uh, people are practicing a particular thing and they are looking for any possible way that they can get their... Uh, their way that they have been doing something for, for so many years. Uh, at least that's the experience that, that I have had, but it's just simply not there. James chapter 1. Uh, so we're very familiar with uh, James 1.27. Um, and this is the whole book of James. Uh, the men are currently studying it. So we've just recently talked about the first chapter of James. The women, not that long ago, were studying through the book of James. So this is something that we've all looked at uh, very recently, but a particular verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So I think it really helps, again, to get the context of the passage. Uh, and so we're going to go ahead and read James chapter 1. So we'll start with uh, Jesse and let's just read... Uh, just read six verses apiece, and everybody that's comfortable reading until we get to the end. James, the bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought forth by the word of truth, that he might be a kind of 
first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. All right, so my chart only goes back to verse 19. But the entire context of James chapter 1, we very clearly can see, is talking about individual action. And, and, and this is, when you are studying through this, like if, if you're going to be honest about the passage and honest about uh, the context, like you, you cannot take church action away from James chapter 1. There is no way that you can honestly take that out of, of what we see here. I mean, just within uh, the last few verses there from 19 to 27, there's like 15 or 16 personal pronouns. It's very clearly talking about an individual Christian and talking about uh, individual uh, action. So when we're talking about the, the man that is to bridle their tongue and to not be deceived and to keep uh, oneself unspotted, it's the same man as that's supposed to visit the fatherless and the widows. It's the exact same man. Verse 27 then, then doesn't just change, and he's ta now talking to, to churches. And so again, we have to be honest with the passage. The one to visit is the one to keep. It's the exact same man. But again... Some people are still going to object. Go ahead, Ken. Word there. I mean, how does a whole church visit the orphans and widows? You know, you, you visit as an individual. <laughs> so James one twenty seven it defines pure and undefiled religion, and you know what? The church must have pure and undefiled religion. So. If the church is going to have pure and undefiled religion, and this defines pure and undefiled religion, then there you go. Roger Hillis, in his book, Following God's Pattern, he says, an institutional preacher once asked me, what kind of religion is the church supposed to practice, vain religion or pure and undefiled religion? He went on to answer for me and tell me that the church should practice pure, undefiled religion, and that verse 27 shows us how to do that. My response, if he had waited for my reply, would have been that this passage doesn't answer his question. It doesn't speak of anything the church is to practice, only the Christian. He was asking the wrong question based on this text. And then Roy Coggle in his book, Walking by Faith, he says, but one has objected that if this passage is not addressed to the church or congregation, then the church cannot practice pure and undefiled religion. In answer to this, we would only suggest that wherever the New Testament scriptures teach that the churches are to be kept pure, free from the spots and blemishes of the world, and wherever the scriptures teach the churches are to care for the destitute, in such passages the churches are taught to practice pure and undefiled religion. But in the above passage, such teaching is addressed to the individual Christian, and to apply it to the churches is to pervert and wrest the passage out of its contextual setting. This no man has the right to do. Remember the passage that we read at the beginning, Isaiah 55, 8, and 9? We cannot change things uh, to fit our own things because it seems right to us. We do not have the authority to do that at all. And yet still some are going to, to say, well, does James 1.27 exclude the church? Do you see the church excluded anywhere in James 1, verse 27? Again, we've got to make sure we understand what the issues are. The issue is not... Are there any passages that exclude the church from general benevolence? That's not the question that we're asking when we're practicing a particular thing. We're not worried about what, does a certain passage exclude us from doing that. The issue is, is there any passage that includes the church in general benevolence? Because we're looking for something telling us that this is the way that we are to be doing things. 
Churches are not included in passages instructing individuals what to do as individuals. So again, that's not the question to ask. You'll still have some uh, that object. And this is uh, from Kevin Case sermon, a quote that he had from Sam Dawson. He says, James 127 does not forbid collective action. It also does not forbid instrumental music and worship, sending money to the Pope, buttermilk on the Lord's table, or any number of things. But for any of these things to be permissible, authority for them will have to be found elsewhere in the Bible. So again, we cannot pervert the scriptures uh, into teaching something or authorizing something uh, just for our own sake uh, when it doesn't actually do so. Any comments on James chapter 1? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is one of the passages that we read last week uh, when we were looking at uh, the pattern that we have as far as the, the church's responsibility in regards to benevolence. And so it might be kind of odd that, well, this is a passage that we talked about in regards to church benevolence and um, now that this is the, also a passage that some will use to try to authorize general benevolence. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and let's go ahead and read the first 13 verses. So I'm not sure where we're at. I think we're at Jeff. So Jeff, if you'll read the first seven, and then uh, Miss Francis read the, the final six. During the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast to you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal had stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as you, I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have All right, so in the King James Version there in verse 13, uh, it says uh, we're giving to them and to all men. And if you've got the King James Version, you'll notice that the word men is actually italicized. We've noted this in a couple of different passages. And what that means when it's in italics is that it is not found in the original manuscripts, but the translators put that in there in their mind to try and clarify. Uh, but other translations, they don't, use the word men, the New American Standard just says uh, contribution to them and to all. That word all, and I think, if I'm not confusing this, Brett actually talked about this uh, in his, uh, some of his lessons. So the word all is actually translated pantus, and um, looking at pantus, uh, we're going to try and better understand what this word all is, but first, Gene Frost 
in his book, Old Issues Do Not Fade Away, he says in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we have a phrase which is a part of the sentence that begins in verse 12, according to the King James Version, that acknowledges a liberal distribution unto the saints in Jerusalem and unto all men. By this, it is reason that the church extended its liberality not only to the saints, but as well to all men, saints and, or saint and sinner alike. Hence, authority is found for general benevolence. But not so. The word men is italicized, indicating that it is not derived from any word in the original language, but was supplied by the translators. Actually, the word all, or pantos, is an adjective. It modifies the noun under consideration, either stated or understood contextually. This is the problem. Is the all limited in the context, or is it unlimited so as to include every one or all persons? Did Paul commend the Corinthians uh, church for supplying the wants of saints in Jerusalem and all other persons, or for supplying the needs of the saints in Jerusalem and elsewhere? And so if you look at the, the definition of this word all that is translated pantos or pantos, Vines, in its definition, in part of the definition, it actually says signifying the totality of the persons or things referred to. And Gene talked about this idea of uh, understanding it contextually, and that's exactly what Vines is telling you with this particular word. What is it uh, uh, in regards to, or what is it uh, in context with? Jeff? Verse 13. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen that translation, but uh, we're going to get to a couple of things in a minute that will, I think, this this one is one of the ones that to me really doesn't make any sense uh, once we uh, we see it, but I'm actually, it's interesting that the New Living Translation add believers because if you just look at the, the Greek definition of all, that's what it's referring to. Well, what's the context talking about? We're going to look at that uh, a little closer here uh, in just a second. So when we're talking about uh, the, the context, uh, we know from all the way back in verse 1, but we also know from what we read last week in Romans chapter 15 uh, and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we know the context of what is being referred to here, this contribution that is being referred to, and it's talking about uh, to the saints in every aspect of the context, whether it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 or it's talking about the same situation in uh, Romans 15 or in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 or even uh, the prior chapter in chapter 8. So the context in which the word is, uh, is used is often determines its exact meaning uh, as with this word all. Unto them refers to saints, but not all saints. It refers specifically to the poor saints at Jerusalem. Unto all refers to other saints, who in some way were helped or benefited by the collection or the contribution. Now, I will tell you, uh, and I know you didn't know this, I'm not a Greek scholar. A Dan King, I would consider a Greek scholar. Not that I'm going to turn to any man for any type of authority, but when I was studying through this several years ago, I reached out to Dan. I consider Dan a friend. And this was a, a reply that he gave to me in regards to this all here in the Panthus. He said, unto all, in 2 Corinthians 9, 13, be probably should best be rendered even unto every one of them. It is most likely a case of the ascensive use of the conjunction chi, commonly rendered as even. Comparable and parallel cases of its usage are found in Galatians 6, verse 16. As many as walk by this rule, even upon the Israel of God, those who walk by this rule are identical with the Israel of God. Ephesians 3, verse 21, unto him be the glory in the church, even in Christ Jesus. Those who are in the church are identical with those who are in Christ Jesus. Also in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, to the saints that are at Ephesus, even the faithful in Christ Jesus. Those who are saints are identical with those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So likewise in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 13, the contribution was to them, even to all of them. Them and all of them are the identical group, except that in the latter instance, Paul explains that the contribution satisfied the needs of all of them, not just a few of them, or even most of them. And so while it might seem strange that you're going to refer to the same group two times, uh, we see it uh, in multiple passages throughout uh, the scriptures. And I'm not for sure uh, how many of these slides that I have, and we're not going to read all of them, but this is uh, various commentators that are talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13, uh, and in every commentary 
that I have listed here, every one of them, even those that some uh, would not be ones that we would turn to for, uh, for uh, uh, study, they all talk about it referring to saints and only saints. And I'm on slide uh, 53 and I've got 98. So uh, we're down to, to six minutes, so I'm not going to take the time to read through, but every one of these com commentaries, it's all the same thing. They all are recognizing that this is referring to all saints, all believers. So let me click through here so I can get to the end here. So one thing that I will also mention with 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we talked about this uh, some last week, this idea of the, the fellowship uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this contribution, this fellowship that they were sharing, we recognize that we cannot have fellowship with unbelievers. Another point that I would make is in verse 12, it says uh, that it's overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. And then the verse 14, it says, while they also by prayer on your behalf, well, who is they? They is the one that's receiving the contribution. Well, I would argue that people of the world that are going to be receiving assistance are not going to go to God and thank God in prayer because of the contribution that they are receiving. So within the context, with this idea of, of fellowship and just looking at uh, the definition of the word, uh, there's no way that it could be referring to anything other than saints. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I was going to say, even if you pull away from the authority part of it and just look at the sensibility side of it, it that we talked about this before, there's just no way that the church can care for all the poor everywhere. And you definitely see that the priority is placed on us looking out for each other. Uh, for other Christians. So when you, when you see, when you just think about all of us, none of us have unlimited funds, neither does the church. That the way we're supposed to behave is when we've got funds, we should be looking for other believers who need, and that's a good point you made, that need it and then we'll bring glory to God for receiving it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, you would, you would hope that just from uh, a little bit of common sense that people would understand that, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the emotions uh, get caught up into this uh, very, very quickly, uh, and people tend to, to lose track of, of common sense when that happens. So in the last four minutes, did I see another hand? So finishing up, um, uh, we have talked about the idea of just uh, authority in general and finding authority for everything that we say uh, and that we do. And one of the things that people might ask is, well, I mean, we don't have this issue here. We're not supporting orphans' homes. We're not trying to push to have a fellowship hall uh, or a kitchen. So why are we going to talk about these things? And I think that this is interesting, what Tom Bunting said in Examples of the Social Gospel. He said, some people will complain that we should not talk about human institutions being supported by the church as an unscriptural arrangement because the problem does not exist in this congregation. And we should not teach against eating in the church building as the misuse of the Lord's treasury since it is not presently practiced here. When do you tell the child the stove is hot before or after he has burned himself? When do you warn them of the danger of the river or lake? When do you tell the son or daughter not to get too close to the edge of the cliff? When is the better time to warn brethren about sin and apostasy before or after they have been overcome? It may be a little late to warn some, but for others there is still time and opportunity to examine some examples of the social gospel and where it takes us. And then finally, this is something that uh, I got from Jeff May, and uh, he talks about this idea of, of going from spoken understanding, where we, we have this understanding, but we're going to continue to talk about it, we're going to continue to teach it, to a time of unspoken understanding, where, well, we understand this, so there's really no point in us continuing to talk about it, uh, and, and then we're going to get to a point, because if you quit talking about it, you're eventually going to reach the point of unspoken misunderstanding. Well, we haven't talked about it in so long, we actually don't really know for sure. So we start misunderstanding things, and that is going to take you to spoken misunderstanding. And so we have to continue to, to preach and to teach on these things that are dangers. Uh, and we have to recognize that this is a danger. And the very last passage that I will leave you with is one that we talked about in the very beginning. And this is something that should 
put fear in all of us. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We can love our liberal brethren. We can love the, the people of the denominational world and they can, they can think that they're doing so many great things. But if we are not doing everything according to the word, According to God's authority, we are practicing lawlessness and we will stand before God and be judged for it in the final day. So thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to teach again. This is something that is very personal to me uh, and I hope that it is something that we all take very seriously. Thanks everybody. Next week, Jesse will take over with parenting.